Uh, take your Bible, turn to John chapter 10, and uh, got us a new prayer list here. We'll go over that here in a little bit, and uh, I hope you've had a good day, and if you haven't, I hope that coming here makes the day better, uh, or joining with us online makes your day better. Uh, I've talked to some people this week that are, that are hurting financially with work and things like that and um, you know times get tough they really do but think about our think about your grandpa grandma or great grandpa or great grandma my great my great grandpa hoggard um, Jesse hoggard and that was my grandpa's name, Jesse. Um, him and his wife, Lorinda, had, uh, I think, 11 or 12 kids, two girls, the rest of them boys. And they had a sharecropper farm. You know what that is. That means they didn't own the land. The bank did. And they farmed it. And the bank got a cut. And then my great-grandpa got a cut. And, of course, when the Dust Bowl came in, when the Depression and the Dust Bowl hit, there went all the sharecroppers. They all either starved to death or they moved out to California to pick fruit. If you've ever read, um, oh, what's that, John Steinbeck's, huh? Grapes of Wrath, yeah. The movie's... I would say don't read the book. The book's got a lot of foul language in it. Watch the movie. It's better. Uh, but anyway, that's, that was a pretty close depiction of how things were like. And uh, my grandpa told me a story during the Depression. He was fortunate that he had a pretty decent job as an electrician. And he worked for Arkansas Power and Light, and he climbed poles... Back in the old, the old fashioned way, he hooked on them spikes on his boots and put a leather strap around that pole and walked up that pole like that. They didn't use none of them lift buckets like they have now. And, um, but he said there was a guy that they brought in as a helper. And at lunchtime, my grandpa, Peepaw, would sit there and eat his sandwich and drink his coffee. And he'd look at that feller that, that just come in. He said, didn't you bring a lunch? Oh, don't want nothing. Don't want nothing. Well, after a couple of days, he found out God didn't have any money. And he didn't have any food. So he told my meemaw, he said, from now on, you make me an extra sandwich every day. And I'll just, and I don't want to hurt this guy's feelings, but I'll just act like that I can't eat the second sandwich and I'm going to throw it away. But I just, and he, and he gave that guy a sandwich every day. But that's how hard it was back then in those times. And if we think that that can't happen again, we're crazy. God can, God can famine a land really quickly. Especially in our world today where we are so dependent upon food movement through the highway systems and the rail systems and the barge traffic and everything like that. Uh, all of that could come to a halt. And... Um, We'd have, to, we'd have to actually pray for our meals. Amen? And we'd be thankful for what we had. So I'll tell you what let's do. Before we read anything, let's go to prayer. And then we'll have our prayer time uh, at the end tonight. We'll go through our prayer list. And if you've got anything on your mind, let us know at the end of the service. Father, we thank you, Lord, for a beautiful day, this sunshine, this warm weather. Lord, it's, it's making us feel good. And we thank you, Lord, for it. We pray, God, that you would, um, as you bring forth blossoms and buds this time of year and, and wake the trees and the grass and the, all the plants up from their winter sleep, I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would awaken us to your word. This word is seed. It is the water upon which the seed falls. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would bring in a good harvest uh, in the lives of your people. Lord, just bless your word tonight. I thank you for it. Teach us great and mighty things that we know not. We ask your blessings now on it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, 
Amen. Um, let me go back just a little bit here, trying to remember where I was leaving off last time. I talked about that and uh, about how the devil kind of gets in our mind. But I brought in this idea of sobriety, about being the gatekeeper of the mind. Uh, sobriety, not just being drunk, but let's say uh, Matthew's a, a young father and he's got children to protect. Uh, well, if somebody comes up on his porch two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, meaning some sort of harm to his goods or his house or his household, his wife and family, it behooves him to be sober enough to have been prepared in case something like that happens. Missouri is a castle law state. You know what that means? A man's home is his castle. I had to explain this to a woman. We was on a cruise and we stopped at this, one of these islands. I can't remember what the name of it was. They got slammed real hard by, um, by that hurricane that went through the Caribbean. I mean, it just tore this island all to pieces. And they were busy putting everything back together. But this, this female tour guide, she did not understand why Americans thought they needed guns. And I tried to explain to her, I said, ma'am, I said, and she was nice about it. She, you know, because we were going to tip her. Uh, but I said, ma'am, I said, you know, not everybody in America is nice people. We've got some downright dirty, mean, evil people that, in our country, in our cities, in our suburbs, in our outlying areas. And I said, we have a law in where we're from, the state of Missouri, it's called a castle law. A man's home is his castle. I have a right to defend my castle against someone coming in to my house to either steal what I've got or to harm either myself or my wife or my children. And I said, I am allowed by law to use lethal force if necessary. And I said, it's, it's sort of the idea that if someone's getting in your door at three o'clock in the morning, they're not there to sell you a vacuum cleaner. And I said, and I said, you may think of Americans as all a bunch of gunslinging cowboys that are going around shooting everything, but that's not how it is. 99% of Americans who own guns legally never will ever use it against another human being in their life. But it's the fact that the people who might want to do you harm know that you probably got a gun in your house and you will use it if you have to. And I don't know if she really understood it or not, but that's just how it is. Uh, so it behooves Matthew to be sober-minded enough to take precautions against someone entering in some other way. That means you don't just lock the front door, you lock all the windows. Make sure everything is secure and tight so that nothing gets in uh, to your house. So John chapter 10, um, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. Who rem I think I told you all this. Who remembers? I, I told you a story about a pastor that had phoned me that had a family start coming to his church, and people were warning this pastor, you watch that family, you watch that man. He'll try to, he'll try to steal your members away from you, or he'll try to steal your church. Did I tell you all that story? Well, the pastor called me or sent me a text uh, last week and said he did have a meeting with the man. 
and confronted him over these issues, and the man agreed that they would home church, him and his family, and watch this pastor's sermons online, because they stream like we do, and he said, we prayed about it, it all worked out good, but I confronted the man and told him right off the bat, I don't mean you any harm, and in Christian love, I'm coming to you with, with this issue. But I ju we just came through a deal in our church where we had a wolf in here, and I really don't feel like dealing with another one. So I think maybe at best, if you like my preaching, you and your family, have you can watch all you want to from home. And the man in the family agreed to that, and I think that was the right thing to do. Um, because clearly this man, by his reputation with other churches, he had a problem. He did not respect that pastor's or that shepherd. The word pastor and bishop are both sheep-keeping words. Pastor comes from the word pasture, where we lead the sheep. Bishop is an, another variant of that. And they both mean the, the man who, who leads and guides the sheep. And there can only be one in a church. But even that pastor must be submissive to the great shepherd, Jesus Christ, who rules over him and will judge him and his conduct in the last days. By the way, I got um, word from... Uh, Pastor Jason Cooley, a fundamental King James Bible preacher, a pastor in New Hampshire, uh, had been in the Homeland Security, and I don't know who all else had been investigating him. And this guy must be dumb because he knew he was being watched. But he still kept doing what he was doing. I mentioned the other day, if anybody out there is tempted to look at graphic images of children, that's, that's my way of saying it without YouTube striking my channel again. You are being watched. It wasn't the government that turned this pastor in. It was the National Something for the Exploitation of Children. That organization, National... Not the National Association. Or, but anyway, it was some group that uses software that sniffs out images and videos and can track down the IP address of where they're coming from and where they're going and this pastor when they went to put a search warrant on him in his house he had two thumb drives in his pocket that was just loaded with graphic images of children on it destroyed him his marriage his church, the church, their church took their website down. You pray for that church. You pray for that man. I don't know if he's reprobate. But you pray for these people. The devil, I'm telling you, sets traps for people, for believers. Somebody say amen. But anyway, um, a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things uh, they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. So he's not only the keeper of the door, but he himself is the door. And therein you see again Christ being multiple things in the Bible. He is the high priest who sacrifices the lamb for the atonement of sins. And yet he also is the lamb being sacrificed for the atonement of sins. He's both of them. 
Uh, all that ever, verse 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd whose own the sheep are not seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because it is a hireling. You know what the hireling says? I don't get paid enough money for this. He doesn't care. He cares about as much as that young punk who's wiped his hand across his snotty nose, run it through his hair four or five times, scratched himself, and then handed you the cheeseburger you got at McDonald's. They don't care, do they? Amen, they don't care. Um, especially in Colorado, they're all high now. Uh, verse... 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must break. Oh, by the way, I'm going to stop right here. And that reminded me, we ordered a Bible. Um, Alicia, we got it in yesterday, right? Um, I posted this on my Facebook feed last week. A, uh, a female uh, trooper, Florida State Highway Patrol, they had, a, they had some crazy drunk woman who was, the police were chasing her down the interstate. She was swerving all over the road. She was doing probably 100 miles an hour down the, down the freeway. And Florida State trooper, a female, she was, she was going toward the lady. She got over in the lane where that lady was coming up. And she knew that she had just passed a group of runners. They were jogging down the side of the road. And she realized that this lady was gunning for those people. She deliberately swerved her SUV directly into the path of that woman to stop her. Could have killed her. Uh, put her in the hospital for a couple days. She's out. We're sending this lady a Bible. We're sending this lady some gift cards. We'll hook. Up. She done got them. Maybe a hundred dollars, and I, I'm going to get a card. And if you want to sign it, I'll have it here Sunday. And you can sign it, but it's going to be from the people of Bethel Church. We're going to let this, and I'm going to put on there, Greater love hath no man than this, and a man laid down his life for his friend. Amen. That story impressed me greatly. This woman didn't even think enough to think of how to protect her own life she only thought of protecting those innocent people that she knew was going to get killed. People like that are hard to come by. Amen? World War II started. You had 14, 15, 16, 17-year-old boys lying about their age to try to get in to go fight the Japs and the Germans. Nowadays, they would protest the war. Burn the flag. Try to burn the government houses down. It's sickening. Anyway, i got to get into the message. So I mentioned that sobriety is the gatekeeper of your mind. And I, and I want you to turn to a passage that God laid on my heart many years ago. Isaiah 28. When... If God lays it on your heart sometime, you write, make, make some notes on this. If God lays it on your heart sometime, do, you, do a study of this. 
look up wine in the Bible or look up, look up the phrase strong drink. Strong drink. Now, wine is interchangeable because they didn't use the phrase grape juice in the Bible. Okay? They, they might have said it, you know, at times the fruit of the vine, but they didn't say grape juice. But in some cases, wine meant fermented wine. In some cases, wine meant unfermented grape juice. The phrase new wine, well, the book of Isaiah says new wine uh, proceeds from the cluster or cometh from the cluster. That tells you, you just squeeze the grapes and the juice that comes out is new wine. It's fresh, it's unfermented, it's non-alcoholic, okay? And that retains the sweetness of the wine and, the, and the, a lot of other things that are in. Wine's good, grape juice is good for you, especially you ladies, it's got a lot of iron in it. Okay, you get iron depleted easily, drink some non-alcoholic wine. But anyway, whenever you see strong drink, almost always you're going to see wine associated with it. And when you have wine and strong drink, then you know the wine is referring to alcoholic wine. And there's several places in the Bible that mention strong drink. And all of them, God is warning you against them. He tells the Levite priests back in the book of Leviticus, he says, none of you priests should drink wine or strong drink when you go into the temple. He said, if you do, then we got a problem because somebody's going to bring in a, a lamb or a goat or an ox for a sacrifice. And if you're buzzed by the wine or the strong drink, then you will not be able to tell the difference between a clean sacrifice and an unclean sacrifice. And I submit to you, we've got pastors and churches all over this country, all over the world, as a matter of fact, who no longer know the difference between what's clean and what's unclean. Amen? They couldn't tell you what sin really is. And so God said, don't do it. And here in Isaiah 28, very profound chapter. There's a lot of learning here. Woe to the crown of pride to the drunkards of Ephraim. There's a woe to those who drink wine and strong drinks. Strong drinks, things like vodka, whiskey. Um, what all else is there? Vodka, whiskey, sake. Vermouth, I don't, I don't know. But whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which are on the head of the fat valleys of them that are overcome with wine. When you overcome with wine, you're drunk. Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one. This mighty and strong one, I believe, is the Antichrist. Look at how it describes him. Which as a tempest of hail. Now, if you want to mark something here, Put down here Revelation 8, because in the first two or three of the trumpet judgments, one of them is hail mingled with fire that God is going to send down from heaven. So I think that's a reference to that, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, God said that I think the army in Joel comes as a storm across sweeping across the land and as a flood of mighty waters overflowing there's your reference to Noah as it was in the days of Noah so shall it be at the coming of the son of man as a flood of mighty waters overflowing shall cast down to the earth with the hand verse 3 the crown of pride the drunkards of Ephraim shall be trodden under feet now, what did Jesus, Jesus used that term, didn't he? In Matthew chapter 5, after he gives the Beatitudes, he says, you're the salt of the earth. And yet, if the salt has lost its savor, its saltiness, it is therefore good for nothing 
to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. How many of you fear that we as Bible-believing Christians will lose our rights to practice our religion as God directs one of these days in this country? It's already... If I cannot... If I cannot say a sentence describing what happened in this country November 3rd, 2020, if I cannot say that on YouTube, or they'll give me another strike on my channel, if I can't say that, something's wrong in this country. That censorship, it is censorship. And what, what, what is the greater good in censoring a, sen a sentence like that. It's, it's the belief that I have. Well, I also believe that the Bible's right in everything that it says. And at some point, because probably 90% of the churches in this country have lost their savor, they are now good for nothing. What do you think the people, I think that was Nashua, New Hampshire is where that pastor pastored that got busted with a pocket full of images of children. And they're going through his computers now. Okay? He's probably got more charges coming. What do you think that town now thinks about that church? Good for nothing. The pastor out there in Oklahoma that was having threesomes with his wife and another guy and his wife told that other guy to shoot her husband in the head while he's asleep. What do you think people think of that church? Good for nothing. So does it matter how we in this church live our lives outside the walls of this place? Does it matter? You never know who you run into. Lisa and I were over at Walmart tonight, and Lisa's picking up her cookies. She's addicted, pray for her. And uh, I, I call them her cigarettes. You got your cigarettes? Let's go. Okay. She's picking up her cookies, and this lady was walking by me, just, and I could just see out of the corner of my eyes she was staring at me. Okay, this is uncomfortable. I looked at her and I didn't recognize, I didn't know her. And she said, are you Melissa's brother? So I, I said, sometimes. No, I didn't say I said, yeah. She works with my sister. And uh, she said, I've watched some of your stuff online. It's good stuff. I said, well, I appreciate that. So we talked a little bit and everything. You never know who sees you that you don't know them. They know you. Now, what if Lisa would have had a carton of cigarettes in the cart with some bottles of vodka and whatever? Okay. There goes our testimony. Right out the door. Okay. I'm not saying try to be perfect. Well, I will say try to be perfect, but you're not going to be good at it. But I will say, let people see the grace of God in your life. Then they will know that you're the real deal. Somebody say amen. Okay, now, um, verse 5. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown of glory and for a diadem of beauty under the residue of his people. You see, whereas they have a crown of pride upon their head, Christ adorns us with a crown of beauty, a diadem of beauty for His people. God's going to glorify us. They glorify themselves. And He says in verse 6, And for a spirit of judgment to him that sitteth in judgment, and for strength to them that turn the battle to the gate. So God promises us, if we'll remain humble, and God's people, He will adorn us so that people see us in a favorable light. He also will give us the ability 
to judge righteous judgment, to know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. Now, verse 7. Now he's going back to the drunkards of Ephraim. They have also erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. So, two types of strong drink in the Bible. One of them is moonshine liquor, whiskey, vodka, rot gut, everclear, fire water, knock them out John stuff. Amen? That's that type. The other type is false doctrine. The wine and the strong drink of false teachings, false doctrines, a false gospel. How come is it that a Mormon can read a King James Bible but not ever see the gospel in it they can only see the gospel in the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants and whatever else they're told in those Mormon meetings. How come Mormons cannot see the real gospel? They are drunk with the wine of false doctrine. How come, some, how come Catholics cannot see that God said, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. They cannot see that. They cannot fathom it. They cannot understand it. How come it is? They are drunk with the wine of false doctrine. Babylon, the Bible says in Jeremiah, is a golden cup in the Lord's hand. And he's made the nations drunk with the wine of her fornication. Sin creates in our minds false doctrines. We get drunk with them. And so we can't, when you're drunk, you can't see the way that you're supposed to go. Uh, I showed Matthew, I guess, or, or John, one of you. Um, Newton County is where Harrison, Arkansas is. That's what got my attention. A video came across my feed that uh, Arkansas Highway Patrolman pulled over a man who was the chief deputy in Newton County, Cubby, chief deputy. He was head of all the deputies in that county. And when the, when the highway patrolman first turned his camera on, the guy's SUV went way down in the ditch and came back up. He crossed the yellow line two or three times, crossed the white line two or three times, pulled him over. He had a blood alcohol of like uh, 0.18 or something like that. Is he going to lose his job? I, I know this for a fact, he lost his wife. Because some gal came to the cop car and you could hear her saying, she doesn't even want to see you. So it's like, uh-oh. The man's drunk and he couldn't even see his way to drive home right. Ruined his whole life. They have erred, look at verse 7, they have erred through wine. So, when you have that drunk spirit in you, you read the Bible and see errors in it. They have erred through wine. You say within yourself, the Bible must say something else besides what's written on the page. Or you read something in the Bible and then you mistake it. You, make, it's, you get it wrong. You cannot understand it correctly. They have erred through wine and through strong drink are out of the way. So here's the roadway. And here's this chief deputy's SUV going way off down in the ditch. You know, it's one of those little highways in Arkansas and, and Missouri. It doesn't have a shoulder. It's just got a little patch here and then there's the ditch. He went all the way down in the ditch over over did it went back in the other lane and he could not keep the car that's what made the arkansas patrolman pull him over because he could not keep his car in the way who's the way christ i am the way the truth the life no man comes to the father but by me 
But when you have that spirit of drunkenness in you, you are out of Christ. You're, you're not part of Christ's people. And you're not following him either. Because he walks down a straight and a narrow path. But isn't it amazing that drunkards walk like snakes do? Back and forth, back and forth. And he says, the priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink. And they err in vision. Which means they can't see things for how they really are. They see two men, Sodomites, in their church arm around each other. And instead of trying to convert them to by the gospel of Jesus Christ, simply insist that, hey, these are the kind of guys I want in my church because they'll bring more in. And for some reason, gay people usually end up having a lot of money with them. And they'll tithe and they'll bring more money in and I'll get paid more, and on and on and on and on. It's usually about the money. But they err in vision. They say, I see nothing wrong with that. They are in love. God is love. Therefore, what they're doing is okay. And it reminds me of the verse in the Bible, every man did that which was right in his own sight. But they failed to consult God on whether it was right or wrong or not. So they err in vision. They cannot see straight. And they stumble in judgment. And eventually, what do drunks after stumbling for so long do? What do they do, Roy? They fall, don't they? That's the falling that's coming. And I do. I believe. I don't know how it's going to happen, why it's going to happen, what's going to make it happen. But I think on the day that the falling away takes place, I literally think everybody falls down to the ground. Just like they did in the plain of Dura when Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody fall, and they all fell. Every one of them. Except three. And then, what do drunks do? Look at verse 8. Drunks puke. All tables are full of vomit. So take a look at this. This is a, what is this? Communion table. It is where we, in, in, the, symbol, in the symbolism of the bread and the wine, commune with Christ's suffering, His death, His sacrifice. We join with Him. And we say, wherever Christ goes, I'll go. If he goes to the cross, I'm going to the cross too. If he leads down the, shadow, the valley of the shadow of death, then I'm going to follow right along with him. Wherever Christ goes, I go. But instead of serving up the communion of the Lord Jesus Christ, they serve up vomit. What sort of animal eats vomit? Dogs. And do dogs go to heaven? Huh? <laughs> and according to some people I've gotten in arguments with. Yeah. God specifically mentioned no dogs in heaven. But that's what they do. All tables are full of vomit and filthiness so that there is no place clean. Then he asks, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? God is looking for people that he can teach. Now, uh, go to verse 19 of John chapter 10. This, now I'm going to start the, the lesson for tonight. Here it is, 8 o'clock. Verse 19. No, and I'm not going to give you everything, all of this tonight. But let's, let's, get it, let's get started into it. There was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these things. Some of the people believed what Jesus was saying. Some of them didn't. And many of them said, 
He hath the devil and is mad. Mad meaning crazy, out of his mind. Why hear ye him? Others said, these are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And let's, let's stop here for a second. Do you think the devil has the ability to heal somebody's disease? What would be your best guess? Okay, and tell me why. Because it's his job to use deception to draw him to one to Okay. Um, Christianity isn't the only religion that boasts of healing. Okay. I read a book, a guy named Jeremy Narby. And if, you, and if you look this guy up, N-A-R-B-Y is his last name. If you look him up on YouTube and watch his videos, this guy, he talks like he is in a constant state of buzz. High. Like marijuana high. Like, hey, you know, like... Wow. That's the way he talks. I don't know if it's years of drinking ayahuasca and everything else, because that's what he's done. But he, he wrote a book. He used to work freelance for pharmaceutical companies. He would take trips down to Central and South America, and he would hook up with various witch doctors to try to find cures for ailments or treatments for ailments. Ibuprofen was discovered that way. Somebody went down to South America. I don't know the whole story, but they, the witch doctor mixed a concoction of roots and leaves and liquids and God knows what, and it took away inflammation and pain out of the body. So, he carries this back. They learn how to synthesize that. And now we have ibuprofen. Okay? So, he, that's what he's doing. He's going down there looking for cures. Because he knows these medicine men. He, he discovers that they actually get in touch with spirits. The medicine men said, see that tree over there? There's a spirit in that tree. See that plant over there? There's a spirit in that plant. And what the witch doctors would do, they would drink this concoction of ayahuasca and, and tobacco and whatever, and it, and it put them into like an LSD thing. And once under that trance, they, all they had to do was speak to the spirits of the forest that all look like serpents, by the way, and ask them how to treat a certain ailment and the spirits would get together and provide this witch doctor with the process of what roots, what leaves, what tree bark to mix together, how to cook it down, how to mix it together, and so on and so on. And this guy was fascinated by that stuff. And he realized that these men, actually, it's very possible that they could come up with the cure for things like cancer, heart disease, on and on and on, Alzheimer's, things like that. So is it possible that the, here, let me ask it a different way. Does the devil have power over the human flesh body? He gave Joe boils, didn't he? Okay, so yeah, I think that the devil has the power to bring healing to people's body in order to persuade people to follow false doctrines. This is why Jesus warned us, be careful of signs and wonders because they could lead you into a trap. Deuteronomy 13, he says it. Um, other places, I can't think of them right now, but he said, the Jews always seeketh after a sign. 
And that was their whole problem. See, the Jews, they got all the signs in the wilderness, didn't they? They saw all the miracles of God in the wilderness. But what was the one thing they tripped over every time? His written word. They didn't mind God doing the magic tricks. They just didn't want to obey his law. Okay? And so be careful people about somebody saying, well, I, I, I listen, I had cancer and I went to Rodney Howard Brown and he healed me. I don't have cancer anymore. Be careful. Watch out for that stuff. I'd rather die a sick man than live and not believe what God said in his word. Amen? Remember in the book of Revelation, they love not their lives even to the death. It's not worth it. So that answers that question. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication, and it was winter. Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. And I want to stop right there because I've, I've got some good stuff after that. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll have fun. Uh, now, I, I tell you, next Wednesday I'm going to get in trouble again, all right? I'm just letting you know that after I teach this lesson next week, I'm going to get in trouble. Yeah. From somebody who just won't believe the Bible. All right?